music. You are now entering the parallel universe. And wipe your feet on the way in. Mark Riley. BBC Six Music. And still Dre, Mark Riley over here, whilst uh, still Rob Hughes over there. Hello, mate. <laughs> Hello, mate. How is you? I'm all right, thanks, pal. like that tune. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Wonderful, that. So, as you can probably guess, we're in the parallel universe. I'm looking at something fairly recent. Well, I say recent, you know, it's the enemy here. 20th of November, 1999. Like I say, it feels like yesterday, but 24 years ago? i tell you what, it was recent at the time. I remember that. Definitely was reason at the time. However, just to kind of mess with time a bit, um, on Tuesday's show, we did PU for, and we looked at the enemy from 1979. There was a story that we reported on that was a hoax about a guy called Steve Ashley, who was supposedly uh, Mark Boland's younger brother and was looking for a record deal and was supporting Blondie and all this kind of stuff. It turned out to be a complete fabrication just to get some column inches in the enemy, which worked. Okay. But what I love about it is he was obviously listening to the show and he, well, he wrote to you, <laughs> sent an email to you, didn't he? He did. Bless him. Yeah. Hello, mate. Uh, so he said, uh, delighted to hear a mention of little old me. I won't read it all out. There is quite a bit, but he just explained the situation. He said that uh, his stage name had been Ashley for some years. Prior to this, he said he hadn't even heard of the folk singer called Steve Ashley until the, his solicitor got in touch and said, you better watch it. So he had to change his name and he chose Travis. All right. Uh, the story itself got picked up by some of the tabloids. And then his um, his manager, Jeff, who sort of co-ran the record shop, I believe, where he lived in Colchester, did a runner then because things got a little bit too hot for him and just left Steve on his own. <laughs> right. Nice. Well, this is going on. He said he did some support slots with some bands, but the band itself folded. He said he carried on for a while in some, in some MOR bands. And then by the late 90s, he got into uh, country music and easy listening and actually did really well, released 10 albums. At one point, at this height, he sold, he said, maybe 400,000 in the late 90s. And then he did a couple of uh, sea shanty albums about five years ago. So all this has got, and published a book called One Man and His Microphone about the other end of the music business, I believe. Do you know what? I can feel a biopic coming on here for Steve. (laughs) So prior to that, he'd been in a glam rock band called Plod in the 70s. Anyway, he said, it was a hell of a journey and I greatly enjoyed it. I did have the thrill of being on the bill with so many big names and I did actually meet Mark Bolan on his tour bus in 76, the year before he died. He said to Gloria, his partner, and you've only got my word for this, he writes, but it's true. He says, uh, Mark said, he looks like me, doesn't he? And gave me a hug. Class. Oh, lovely. Okay, what a uh, great story. Thanks for getting in abs- touch, Steve. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, back to 1999. So in the news on page three here, Oasis have, re- have revealed that former Ride and Hurricane number one guitarist Andy Bell is to be their new bassist. Uh, Oasis have known Andy since the early days of touring when Ride was special guests at their show at the Brighton Centre in 94. He said, I'm very excited when I got asked. It was not a difficult decision to make. Oasis have always been an inspiration. Uh, Hurricane number one singer Alex Lowe confirmed his band had now decided to call it a day, but wished him the best of luck. And the new Oasis lineup is compl- uh, completed by Jem, former lead singer and guitarist with Heavy Stereo. Both Heavy Stereo and Hurricane number one were previous label mates, of course, with Oasis on creation. So it was all changed, wasn't it? It was, yeah. I mean, you've got to go around and cherry pick the uh, the uh, musicians that you want, haven't you? And if you're in the position that Oasis were, then you can do exactly that, can't you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, also in the news, Elastica have been dropped by the US record company Geffen. It's reported that Geffen ran out of patience waiting for the band to deliver the follow-up to their uh, self-titled debut. Since the summer, the band's management have insisted that the album is finished and that Justin Frischman has been working on a final track list, but the finished product has yet to emerge. Uh, the band released an EP in August featuring the album track How He Wrote Elastica Man with the Falls' Marky e. Smith, plus uh, five other tracks ju- recorded during the sessions. So this was uh, obviously... The Menace came out, I think, a year after this, didn't it? And it wasn't particularly well received, the Elastica's second album. And of course, they'd had all that kind of hassle with the first record, but with plagiarism, hadn't they? Wire and the Stranglers and what yeah, have you. Yeah. And I know that Justine Frischman did say later she wished it just been a one album project. She wished she just kind of really left it alone. Yeah. Well, yeah, with the benefit of hindsight, it sounds that's the case, isn't it, really? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and underneath that, you've got Bjork releases her first material for two years on the soundtrack to the new Spike Jones film, Being John Malkovich. Uh, the track Amphibian is featured in the closing credits. Uh, Being John Malkovich, which stars Cameron Diaz, tells the story of a man who discovers a corridor which leads into the brain of actor Malkovich. Following the, the discovery, he gives the general public guided tours inside Malkovich's mind. Malkovich himself has a role in the film. Have you seen this? I don't think I have, you know. Oh, haven't you? Right, I was going to discuss it, that's all. But um, You can I, discuss I, it. 
f- yourselves. <laughs> I really didn't like it. I found oh. it really, really too kind of self-knowing and the rest. I didn't know whether you had a view, but clearly, obviously, you've not seen it. Do you know what? The, the reason I'm so vague is that I think I started to watch it with Trace, and then I think we just tailed off pretty damn quickly. So oh. if, if that rings a bell with me, then <laughs> we're probably in agreement, aren't we? Yeah, I think we are, really, yeah. Uh, and Nick Drake will be remembered 25 years after his death with a night dedicated to his life at the Cube Cinema in Bristol at the end of November. It'll include the first showing of the documentary A Stranger Amongst Us, searching for Nick Drake, which features tributes and anecdotes from a number of the singer-songwriters' friends and colleagues. I mean, the cult of Nick Drake really took off in the 90s. I remember buying the Way to Blue compilation and wondering, oh, why I haven't heard this music before? Because it, it was just so incredible. But do you know what? I mean, um, <clears throat> Alan Duffy, hello, Alan, he had a great label called Imaginary. He put loads of great records out, World of Twist and all manner of things. And um, and he released, a, he did a lot of tributes to. And mm. one of them was Nick Drake, a tribute to Nick Drake. And I remember the High Llamas did at the Chime of a City Clock. And that's the first time that I'd ever heard of Nick Drake. I didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't right. aware of him at all. And then I heard that particular song at the Chime of a City Clock and I thought, Mm. This is magical, you know. And I eventually ended up finding out a lot more about Nick Drake. But at that point in time, I was completely ignorant of him. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was the same for a lot of people, wasn't mm. it? You discover it at certain times. And uh, still, remarkably, there is no apparently no found footage yet of him ever kind of playing anywhere. There's no live footage out there, is there at all? Is there not? And I, I didn't know that documentary existed either. Yeah, uh, there's a great biography as well by Patrick Humphreys. Uh, all the stuff going on, just very, very briefly here. Uh, the Blur are on um, Get the Heavyweight Arts flagship slot. Uh, previously accorded such greats as UB40, obviously enemy, tongue, tongue-in-cheek here. By being the subject of a South Bank Show special on Sunday, Damon Albone claims in the programme that the South Bank Show special on the Smiths inspired him to form a band in the first place. He said, I was round at Graham's house and I remember thinking, no one's going to tell me that pop music is finished. Bands, into, you know, influencing other bands, right. et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but we're not going to go to Blair, are we? No, we're not. We're going to go to Flaming Lips, aren't we? We are, yeah. And James Great Records, no denying, and produced by David Friedman, who also worked with Mercury Rev, and the sound on it is amazing, Bob. But um, I do remember watching that Fearless Freaks documentary mm, mm. and uh, <laughs> and Gibby Haynes if I remember rightly is at the dentist um, and they're drilling <laughs> away and, you know um, <laughs> Gibby Haynes from the butthole surfers and um, and yeah somebody says to him what is Wayne Coyne's biggest talent and he says Stephen Drozd <laughs> Stephen Drozd okay. of course being a multi-instrumentalist yeah. uh-huh. who, who plays drums on that and it, the drumming on it is just uh, it's got to be air drums on that it doesn't matter if you can play air any instrument it's got to be air drums hasn't it Stephen Drozd a genius yeah, phenomenal yeah just brilliant that so we'll look at the enemy here 20th of November uh, 1999 and James Oldham goes to travels to Oklahoma to meet Flaming Lips well Wayne Coyne being the figurehead uh, says that the Soft Bulletin is the ninth and greatest album of their career so far which probably most people wouldn't argue with. Uh, so there's lots of talk about growing up and certain recreational activities as a teenager, which gets pretty repetitive at times. One of the interesting things that comes up in the interview is he says there was never much to do where he and his bandmates lived. So a lot of the ideas just came out of pure boredom, just sitting around thinking, trying to come up with stuff. So which is why is a lot of this cosmic stuff going on. Obviously, there were certain things being imbibed which played a part in that, but it was just pure boredom that led to this in the first place. And they were very playful, weren't they? I mean, she don't use yeah. jelly and all that kind of stuff. They were, they, they were, it wasn't exactly humorous, but it was mischievous, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, playful is the right word. Uh, Beastie Boys are on the cover, and they're interviewed in the middle. So, interviewed in uh, New York City to promote the new uh, retrospective, The Sounds of Science, for which they've written liner notes for each track. So, talk inevitably turns to the early days where they appear to be you know, so antagonistic, didn't they? Made headlines everywhere they went, especially when they came to the UK. Uh, Adam Yauch, was it Yauch? I never quite know how to pronounce it. I thought it was Yauch, but, you know, I might be wrong. Uh, now a committed Buddhist, uh, describes the band, uh, big band's big hit, Fight for Your Right to Party in the 80s, said we were definitely getting drunk and acting really stupid and trying to purposefully be obnoxious because we thought it was funny, but it was all just stupid exaggeration. And so they then talk about these various stories, especially in the UK tabloids, that were made up about them and printed, which just weren't true, and how it affected them. Uh, Mike D says, once it gets printed, one place that uh, establishes it as fact, everybody else follows suit. He said, I think uh, the thing that we weren't prepared for was the exaggeration stopped coming from us. When it went to the tabloid level, it took 
the whole thing into a completely negative and like, to be honest a kind of frightening and alienating area it's easy to look back on it now in this context and see it all leading up to that point but at the time we just didn't really know what was happening well if you deal in irony heavily like they did then it, there will be people out there who won't get it and that's when you're in trouble and you know of course the case for the defense you just heard there well they did have the girls dancing in cages didn't they because i, I saw yeah. that all yeah, I was going. I know. I wish I'd seen that time. I, mean, I know you saw it, but I mean, you know, as as a spectacle, was it a good show? Yeah, Yo, you know, yeah, of course it was. I mean, myself and Mark Radcliffe formed the Indecipherable Boys um, some years later, and it was good that I'd seen them just to use it as a template. But it was uh, we, uh, we replicated it, just stomping around the stage, crushing cans of beer, empty cans of beer, and throwing them in the audience, you know. But but it was great. I mean, it was a spectacle, and it was a bit of a circus, you know. I mean, of course, if you look at them a bit further down the line, when they when they kind of jettisoned all that, uh, the, the playfulness, if you like. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, there was something else, you know. Is that footage of them doing sabotage? Is it on Letterman? Oh, it Which, is, yeah, I know. Oh, it's, it's great. Oh. It's one of the greatest things I've ever seen in my life. So, you know, you can't take anything away from them. But, yeah, they did kind of stick their head in the lion's mouth and get it at one point. Yeah, totally. I love the way they just transform themselves with Paul's Boutique and, and onwards. In the Rock Books Roundup, he says, what do you do when it all falls apart? You write a book. After the demise of Teardrop Explodes, Julian Cope was, in his own mind at least, an ex-pop star. He retreated to his hometown of Tamworth, recorded two stunning but unsuccessful solo LPs, but built up a vast collection of toy cars, gradually learned to deal with pop life again. Thus goes the second volume of his autobiography, Repossessed, which has been helpfully packaged with volume one head on uh, while the absence of the familiar personalities from the teardrops days makes repossessed a slightly less colorful prospect his incredible memory and acute sense of the ridiculous make for an enthralling narrative uh, seven out of ten gives it says rising to a nine if you haven't already read head on which is possibly the greatest pop autobiography ever if you want to know about the liverpool post-punk scene centered around eric's head on is the book to read isn't it it's just it fabulous. is yeah i mean will will sergeant's book is great as well well that does document yeah. his own journey of course and uh yeah i'm also these see i've got that copy of that modern day antiquarian which um ah. is a pretty collectible book these days i believe it is, yeah. That's a that's a big old beast, that isn't it? It's a big old unit. <laughs> it's a big old unit. <laughs> three, three times in three shows. I love it. I was gonna. I just stopped shy of saying that, Mark. I'm glad you did it. Well done. Uh, on the new album's front, you got Beck's Midnight Vultures, reviewed by Keith Cameron, who likens it to a classic Prince album from the '80s. Uh, REM and Friends' Man on the Moon soundtrack, soundtrack, which was the Andy Kaufman story, wasn't yeah, it? With, yeah. Um, Jim Carrey. Uh, the gigs this week. Let's see. You got Chemical Brothers at Blackpool Empress Ballroom. Uh, Shaq headlined the enemy premier tour at Leeds University with Coldplay, bottom of the bill. Um, Joy, Joy Zipper at the Bull and Gate in London. You've got Pharaoh Sanders at the Camden Jazz Cafe. The Radar Brothers at Manchester Roadhouse. Hello, Tony Husband, who he kind of discovered them, yeah, essentially. Yeah, he's a big, big fan. Uh, Elvis Costello at the Futurist Theatre in Scarborough. You've got Pavement at Glasgow Barrowlands. Uh, let's see, Bewitched at Birmingham NEC. They were huge, weren't they, for a while? Yeah, I took our toddlers to see them at one point. Oh, did you? Yeah, of course we did. We used to do that again on Radio 1 because they used to do that, uh, what is she like? And we used to, <laughs> every time every time we'd say it, we'd put some That's Irish right. dancing music on and we'd just both get up and dance. And it was a TV item, really. It didn't work on the radio. That didn't stop no. us doing it for months and months and months, man. I like it. The head coats at the Boston Arms in Tufnell Park, a half man, half biscuit, the star and garter in Manchester, and Echo and the Bunnymen at Liverpool Royal Court. But never mind all that. Gig of the week, Mark and Lard's Christmas extravaganza at the Forum in London, build as their only UK show well south of Watford, featuring the horse and the indecipherable boys. You mentioned it already. Oh, yeah. Uh, and in the dance tent, Chemical Toilet Brothers versus uh, Fat Boy Slim Fast, of course. <laughs> yeah, it's a classic, mate. Hey, I don't know why you're smirking. I wish I, I wasn't smirking. No, I, you I, wish you were there. <laughs> don't you i wish i'd gone really do on the live front eminem plays manchester academy so this is 99 i think well i think this is his first proper show over here it Were was because my yeah my nephew mark um got in touch with me and said could you possibly get me in to see eminem and i'd heard my name is at that point in time and i was like really and he's going yeah yeah he's great well, can you get me in and i was like yeah you're welcome to it mate i'm not going of course he was right and i was wrong my name is it's a great record it is a brilliant record. Just quickly review here. At his best tonight, it says he's like the cracker spawn of uh, licensed to ill era Beastie Boys, all bawdy humour, gratitude, and a refreshing willingness to metaphorically wave his willy about in the wind and to hell with the consequences, as well as making a splendidly simplistic stomping hip hop. 
Uh, oh. It was only on for 45 minutes, though, it says. Bit of well, a short show. It's probably enough. Um, okay. No offence to anybody. Right, OK, Bob. Um, excellent. Loved it, as always, mate. I will catch up with you very soon. And uh, just, uh, yeah, get his next. Thanks to everybody for listening and bumping our figures up. You're great. And uh, we'll see you on Monday night. Cheers. All. Prepare to exit the parallel universe. Mark Riley, BBC Six Music. And shut the door on your way out.